Hi everybody, it's Mike here from Two Dads UK. Um, today is a really special episode uh, and one that I'm I'm honoured to be able to be talking to, uh, certainly one of the, the, the leaders in this particular field. Um, I'm doing a, a recording today uh, with Rich Vaughan uh, live from LA. So for those of you that uh, know of Rich Vaughan, uh, he is a facility law attorney and he combines his passion for family formation with over 20 years of experience in business and technology law and founded International Fertility Law Group, um, one of the most successful and best known law firms in the world focusing on assisted reproductive technology law. In addition to his busy legal practice, Rich devotes numerous volunteer hours to advancing in the field of ART law and is a dedicated advocate for um, LGBT intended parents and families. He is immediate past chair of the American Bar Association Family Law Section Committee on Assisted Reproductive Technology and played a leading role in developing model legislation to assist states in regulating assisted reproductive technology, uh, medical providers and donor and surrogacy agencies. Uh, there's more. Uh, away from the office, Rich is a proud advocate for LGBT equality and gay and lesbian parenting and as a member of and supporter of the Family Equality Council, who we've spoken to previously. Uh, by providing the community service in the medical health and wellness industries too, uh, this, is, this is where he puts us to shame. This man is also an experienced fitness instructor, triathlete, a former paramedic, and a board member of a medical device company. Uh, and in 2008, Rich and his spouse, Tommy, were married in California and became the proud parents through egg donation and surrogacy to their twin boys, uh, Aiden and Austin. I am thrilled and almost absolutely blown away by all of these accolades. Welcome to Rich Vaughan. How are you? I'm good, Michael. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of us now listening, thinking I, I need to be doing more with, with, with my life. You're just ticking far too many boxes and putting us all to shame. Um, an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for taking time out of your morning um, for, uh, for this. Um, for those that are, that are listening that are from the, the surrogacy world, or certainly from the fertility world, um, they'll know of certainly you and your, your firm. So I, I have to commend and, and congratulate and just in awe of the work that your firm does for our community um, and certainly the way it helps and supports intended parents uh, all over the world uh, in ensuring uh, a smooth surrogacy uh, and fertility journey so so thank you from all of us firstly oh thank you it's, it's a real honor and privilege to help people going through this process having been through it myself so it's it's mm -hmm. really so how are you anyway uh doing well we're holding up uh, my husband is at home uh schooling the kids and uh, managing that madness and <laughs> um, you know, the kids are doing well they're very they're 11 now so they're able to focus on their homework themselves and, and not be too much of a burden in that respect, but they're missing their friends and, yeah. you know, but getting, we're all getting along just fine and staying healthy. So thank you. Good. No, 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 no problem at all. Um, okay then. So uh, let's, let's begin with, with some of the questions then. So I'm sure there's demand or rising demand in your services currently, which, which appears to, you know, what appears to be the most common, um, issue or problem at the moment that intended parents are contacting you about? Well, the, the biggest problem we're facing at the moment is in international intended parents who are stuck overseas, unable to get here, or facing some difficulty in getting here to the U.S. for the birth of their children. Okay. And, I, and I'm, I'm assuming that's that's continued to, 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 to rise or, or amplify? Uh, yes, it's it's been kind of a consistent thing. You know, of course, once the travel bans were announced, there was a lot of rushing around, not quite sure how to handle this, and a lot of phone calling to the State Department and the consulates and the embassies to figure out what sort of policies they were going to be applying to these situations so we could get these parents here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm sure. Um, and I guess from from here in the UK, for example, there've been um, recent cases which which have been thankfully successfully challenged, um, allowing a, a one birthing partner rule um, 
obviously intended parents not being birthing partners, being actual parents, um, has been one of the ways where um, lawyers have, have challenged that here in the NHS to ensure that intended parents are there for the birth of their child. Um, you know, is or are US hospitals allowing intended parents to be present at, at the birth? So assuming we can get the parents here for the birth, then the next question is, you know, are they going to be allowed at the hospital? And the hospitals are setting their own individual policies. This is not a matter of state or local law. It's hospital by hospital as to what they feel is best for the safety of not only the healthcare workers, but the patients who are there and the parents and the children. So uh, we've seen a full broad spectrum of, of uh, responses from the hospitals. Some have not allowed anyone other than the patient. So in this case, the, the surrogate who is delivering uh, to be yeah. in the hospital and they literally will care for the child in the hospital and bring the baby to the, the front door, if you will, uh, to meet mm -hmm. the parents once the baby is ready to go. Others have allowed only one support person, in which case that might be the surrogate's husband if uh, she's married, uh, yeah. or sometimes one parent or sometimes both parents. And we've also seen a situation where they would only allow one parent in at a time for a period of 24 hours. So they weren't yeah. allowed to leave for 24 hours and then they could wow. still. So parent two could come in after 24 hours. So we've seen a, a wide variety of responses from hospitals and there's really nothing we can do to change those policies. No, so I, the, the, I guess the, the impact is greater than what people initially see um, in terms of, uh, and, and, I, and I think from what, what we're seeing here is a lot of that is, is, is due to social distancing really, and obviously infection control. Um, which, which is, which is one of the things that we, we, we just can't challenge. Absolutely, and um, hospitals are reducing the amount of checkpoints or entry points into the hospital. They're having temperature checks, um, masks are required. You know, ID must be provided. I mean, that would be required anyway. But you know, th they're definitely um, tamping down on this to make sure that they are doing their part to reduce the further spread of the virus. Wow. Um. What progress has been made um, supporting intended parents with issues obtaining things like travel documents? Because I've, I'm reading various things in the media and I'm not quite sure what to take or what to, 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 to believe. So, you know, is, is, is that a challenge currently? It is a challenge and there are two issues with travel documents. One is getting here to the US and one is getting back home. Yeah. So let's focus for a moment on getting here. Um, if a parent has a visa or an ESTA, it may have been canceled or revoked or temporarily um, you know, um, held invalid due to the travel bans. And, and when we have been talking to the State Department, it's, it's not really an issue of whether you have a visa or ESTA anyway. It's more of an issue of entry into the U.S. So if you're in a country that is subject to the travel ban, then under the presidential proclamation, uh, those parents are not allowed to enter unless they qualify for one of the exceptions under the presidential proclamation. Um, at first, we thought the exception that says a parent of a US citizen um, child could travel would qualify as one of these exceptions, but we're being told rather consistently now from state departments, uh, from consulates and embassies around the world that that does not qualify because they're not a parent of a U.S. citizen child until that child is born. That child is not a U.S. citizen until the birth. So while they acknowledge that this is an important um, reason for them to travel, they're being very strict about what the proclamation says and what the exceptions, uh, how the exceptions are written. So what's evolved of late is there is another exception to the travel ban that a person can travel if it can be shown that it is of national interest to the US that they be allowed to travel. And so the argument we're making successfully now is that these parents need to be able to travel here to um, be there for the birth of their child, to not only uh, be there for the birth, but to take care of the child and to take the child from the hospital when the child is ready to go, because otherwise we are crowding the healthcare system here with patients that don't be staying. So the national interest argument is we need to free up our healthcare resources for those who are sick and in need. And so that argument is winning uh, the, the day. Yeah, yeah. And, and valid. I think it's, a, it's one of the issues that we have here all year round in terms of 
um, beds being blocked for for the for those that, that aren't needed, and particularly at the moment in a pandemic, you know, you would think that they want those beds clearing, uh, and 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 the people within from a visitor's point of view, um, not on site too from an infection control point of view. Correct, correct. So what we've been doing is writing letters as the attorneys for the clients to the consulate general or the ambassador, depending on where the, the clients are coming from, uh, so that they're getting it from the lawyers. We're also drafting letters for either the hospital to sign or the obstetrician or perhaps even the IVF doctor to state from a medical professional's perspective that there is a national interest in, in having these parents here and letting them go home quickly too. So that yeah. seems to be working. And then once that paperwork has been presented and approved, actually just to back up for a second, all of that paperwork goes to the local consulate, but then it gets sent to the State Department in Washington, DC. And that's where wow. the final decisions are made. So there's a bit of time that has to be factored in for A, to gather your paperwork, B, getting it to the consulate or embassy, then then it going to the State Department in D.C., and then coming back for final approval. Wowzers. Um, I can then, then leading on nicely then would be the, the, the question related to anyone that's watching this that maybe isn't due for another three or four months time. Um, what would your advice be to those intended parents? Well, a couple of different things. One is to also just add to what we were just saying that another rule that seems to be taking some shape with the State Department is they may only be allowing one parent to travel. So even if you qualify and you've made your case for the national interest exception, they may still limit the number of travelers who are coming over and, and we want to all help reduce the, the spread of the virus. So just keep that in mind. But in terms of those who have births coming in the next three to four months, uh, you know, in our firm, we are planning at least three months out uh, to get ready for these cases because our argument to the State Department is that the parents need to be here um, up to four weeks prior to birth. Uh, that includes two weeks for quarantine. Yeah and then two weeks in case the child is born early, then if you back up from those four weeks, at least another two weeks at a minimum to process all of these requests and the paperwork, et cetera, and perhaps four weeks just to make sure you're not having to rush around last minute. So mm -hmm. we're looking at definitely getting started two months before the birth with all of this paperwork. Mm -hmm. Wow, lots to, lots to consider then. Uh, so I, you know, I, I knew this would, be giving us such valuable sort of nuggets of information for people um, because this is a such a moving moving target and, and feast so it's just so useful to know that okay so we've got a couple of minutes left then rich so in terms of your top tips for anybody watching um that is currently um either in um a us um surrogacy arrangement or is about to embark on it what would you what would your top tips be my top tips for, for both would, would basically be the same. Uh, one is to research and prepare um, and, and do this in advance so that you're not having to run around last minute. So think ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is to, you know, stay calm, stay the course. Uh, we, in, in any surrogacy, there are bumps in the road. Um, yeah. you know, it, it, we all hope that it goes smoothly, but, you know, these are humans that are involved in this process. It's a long process. So there can be bumps in the road stay calm, you'll get through it. And that's the same for the COVID crisis as well. We will get through this and stay the course. In terms of the travel bans and all of these letters that have to go back and forth, be prepared to maybe even get an initial one or two no's. You might get rejected initially, but keep persisting, okay. stay calm. It won't do you any good to um, anger the people that you're looking for approval from. So uh, stay calm and stay the course. And then I guess the last point is to basically just be patient. Um, all of this takes uh, quite a bit of time. Every surrogacy journey is on average about 18 months anyway. This delay may be two or three months, maybe four months, but in the grand scheme of a child's lifetime, two to three months of a delay, whether it's to start your surrogacy or to deal with some of the issues you're dealing with now, which hopefully will be more, no more than a few weeks, you know, it's just a small delay. You will get through it. Just be patient, stay calm, stay the course. 
Incredible. Um, Rich, thank you so much for your time. You know, it's, it's, you can clearly see why you guys are the leaders in what you do. Thank you so much for giving us the time today. Um, that's Rich Vaughan. Thank you so much. And I'll speak to you soon. All the best. Take care. Same to you. Bye-bye. If you like what you've seen so far, head over to our website at www.twodaddies.co.uk. There you can read our blog and subscribe to our newsletter. Or find us on Facebook and Instagram, simply searching at twodads.u.k.